morning, everyone. Uh, welcome this morning to Hokyoji's Sunday Dharma Talk. My name is Owen, and this morning I am happy to introduce Dokai George Sinroshi, guiding teacher of Hokyoji. He's been away for an extended time on family matters, and I believe he's happy to be home. The title of his talk this morning is Birds Chirping. Welcome back, Dokai san. You're welcome. So do I just start now, or do we do a chant or something? No chance, but I think you just begin. No chance? Okay, so I just sit down and start talking. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> yeah, well, don't forget the Roshi part. <laughs> <laughs> no. <clears throat> Once um, no. one of the Dharma brothers, uh, there was a newspaper article about him, and they called him you know, so-and-so Roshi. And I thought, oh, what the, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> this was like 20 years ago. And, uh, and then actually um, somebody wrote an article about me many years, well, a few years ago, and they put Roshi on the side. And I thought, oh, you just can't control this world. <laughs> <laughs> People calling you such names such dastardly names. So, anyway, um, <clears throat> I'm going to start my talk. Uh, so it's very nice to see all of you. Um, we have two people on site here that I can see to my right and left, and then all of you. <clears throat> the two people on site are Kosen and um, Meredith. Um, Meredith Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva, who was uh, lay ordained by uh, Tim Burkett. So um, that's it. So birds chirping, you know. You know, what's happening now at Hokyoji is we're becoming like really developed <laughs> um, in ways that um, have never happened before. So people ask you what what's going to be the title of your talk like five days in advance before before you give it. And basically, in my case, I have no idea what I'm going to talk about five days from now because I don't know what's going to be happening. Um, however, there is a, a kind of a certain story that goes with the birds chirping. Um, one of my students, and we'll get into that word students a little later in this talk, called, called me up one morning um, a few days ago. It was when it was really warm here. It hasn't been warm, that warm lately. But I had my windows open to my room, and I answered the phone, and we talked for a while, and he said, where are you? <laughs> you know, I said, I'm in my room. <laughs> it's a, there's birds chirping all over the place. And uh, I said, what? Well, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess there are, you know. So I held my phone up to the window so he could hear them. And, um, and he said, wow, that's so cool. You know, I thought, well, <laughs> for me, it's like, this is like nothing so unusual. But I do uh, realize, yeah, there's something unusual about living here in this place where you can just open your window and, and hear lots of birds chirping. So originally the title was going to be something about joy. So maybe could have made it like joy, birds chirping. Maybe that would have been a little better title. But uh, like I say, actually, five days ago, I had no idea what I was going to talk about this morning. And uh, I thought, you know, birds chirping, that leaves pretty wide 
window, you know, that you could talk about. So, so I'm going to go ahead and start my talk. <clears throat> I gave a talk uh, a week ago um, at Clouds and Water, and I'm on day 12 of a cold, which still is uh, sort of hanging with me, but I don't actually feel really bad. I just, uh, thank you. I was going to ask, see, here we go. There you go. What a great attendant. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was gonna. I hadn't thought about that, but I might have to ask you, Colson, to provide some Kleenex. So uh, actually, I need to blow my nose. Is that okay? Um, so uh, a week ago, <clears throat> I gave a talk at Clouds and Water, and I was really sick a week ago. I was on. I had to have a. My opening statement was a full disclosure disclosure that I'm on a lot of drugs um, <laughs> because I had to do it. Otherwise, I would just sneeze every minute or sniff my nose every other word. Um, and the only problem was it does help or cough. And <clears throat> even though that helps in that way, it kind of makes your mind a little fuzzy these drugs. Uh, I'm not on drugs right now, but I'm not feeling that great. However, I actually don't feel too bad. I feel like it's, it's good to be back here at Hokyoji, and I've gone through a, quite a very difficult period in my life, maybe one of the most difficult ever, uh, for the past few weeks. Still processing it, I had a session with my um, therapist, you know, like a week ago, <laughs> told him all my stuff and uh, thought, well, okay, I'm done with it. I don't have to say it anymore. But I had another conversation with Mio O, you know, on uh, a few days ago, unloaded it on her. Last night went out with Meredith and Kosin and unloaded on them. <laughs> so hopefully I'm getting to the end of this unloading thing about what I've gone through with my sister. Um, I don't know, still processing it. So it's just really deep pain to see a, a person just enter into a self-destructive mode, who's my only living relative left. So that's what's going on for me. And uh, immediately after I got her house, five bedroom, 2,500 square feet house, emptied out of every single item. <laughs> it was just filled with stuff. I took about 20 minutes and I just went around and looked at each room. It was totally empty. <laughs> I looked in the closets, they were totally empty. And it just was like a, such a satisfying feeling <laughs> that, that this house was filled with so much stuff. And, it, and then I emptied it out and I basically did it alone. So I took, uh, 20 or 30 minutes to gloat about my achievement. <laughs> and uh, so two nights before I left, she had a drinking spell. She fell down, broke a bone, another bone. So she's in the hospital now. Um, got some kind of screw nail screwed into her hip into uh, some kind of pelvic break. I don't know. Um, so now she's in rehab, which I feel good about. She can't drink and uh, she's safe for three weeks. So I'm feeling pretty good about things. So yeah, it was about, uh, so yeah, 
what I was thinking, you know, early in the week is to talk about this. Uh, joy, this is a book by Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, Joyfully Together. Is that like backwards? <laughs> well, it's right. You can read that or it looks backwards to me. <laughs> but anyway, it's a little it's good. book by Thich Nhat Hanh. Okay, you can see it. All right. Anyway, it's, oh, and it's called Joyfully Together, The Art of Building a Harmonious Community. Um, so I like that, that, that particularly the art of building a, a harmonious community. <clears throat> so art means uh, a discipline. Some something you practice and learn about, and you learn from the mistakes, but you just keep practicing. And um, that's something I really wanted to create here at Okyoji because I had, <clears throat> had participated in in other Zen centers, and I. Sometimes I didn't feel we were practicing harmoniously together. So I, I really wanted to try to create that here at Hokyoji. And that's why I got a little pushback, I guess that's the word they call it these days, about calling it the Hokyoji Zen Practice Community rather than Hokyoji Zen Center. But I wanted to call it a community because as small as our little community is, it's a little community. And there's a extended community too, that comes and stays here. And I want to keep working on cultivating the art of uh, joyfully living together in harmony. It's not that it's gonna happen, by itself because <clears throat> you get a community of people living together and there's gonna be problems. There's no way around that. That's, that's human stuff. But the, um, the issue is when problems and challenges arise, what, how do you handle it? So that's the art. Um, <clears throat> So that was my idea, but I changed my idea about what I was gonna talk about <laughs> a little while ago, because it wasn't working out so well in my mind. So maybe another time we'll go there. So right now, <clears throat> for the purpose of the, today's talk, I'm gonna talk about, um, oh yeah, birds tripping was the, the um, title. And um, I have to say, we've been talking about joy, you know, quite often here at Hokyoji in the past year. <coughs> and uh, we found that, you know, joy isn't this blissful thing that just hits you like a, well, it can sometimes hit you like an explosion. Um, but most of the time it's, little tiny things. And uh, for more than a year, I haven't put food in my bird feeders for some reason or another. But when I got back this uh, time, after being away for three months, I, I filled them up the other day. And today was the first day I saw a bird. <laughs> sure, a little, uh, I think it was a nut hatch. Once one bird finds your feeder, lots of other birds show up. I'm still waiting for hummingbirds. They haven't shown up yet. So that was just a little moment of joy that I had just a, an hour ago. So I'm going to... Um, Read a, a passage from um, 
Cuddy Ray Roshi's book um, called, um, it's called, You Have to Say Something. Today, I really didn't feel like having, I was going to say anything. So I was thinking of uh, quoting, I know, I know one passage from, I mean, I know several passages, but there's a particular passage from Returning to Silence uh, that I was going to talk about, because I was just say, I'm going to return to silence <laughs> and not say anything. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty powerful passage, but unfortunately, I couldn't find the book, <laughs> uh, wherever it was, somewhere in my library, but I don't know where. So I sh shifted my attention to uh, another <laughs> a passage called Walking Alone as All Beings. And uh, Kage Roshi, this is a book by, edited by Steve Hagen. Hang on one second. There are two course, discourses in, on the Sangha by the Buddha that appear to be contradictory. In one, he speaks of the virtues of living in solitude. In the other, he says, we should find a wise and good friend with whom we can walk with throughout life. But these teachings aren't actually contradictory. Both refer to the spirit of self-discovery of coming to the realization that you live with all beings and your life is inseparable from those of others, particularly from those of others who you love deeply, whether you want to or not, <laughs> whether they're your mother, spouse, sister, brother, But you have to, we have to walk together with those beings. One uh, passage that I've been thinking of this, uh, this week is when the Buddha says, you know, abandon your family. Because it, it's just going to be troublesome for you. Now, most of us, I think, that's a, kind of a, a difficult thing, statement to wrestle with. Because probably for most of us, our family, our, I don't have children, but children, spouses, brothers, sisters, maybe they have brought you the most joy that you've ever experienced in your life. Maybe so. But I would also suggest maybe it brought you the most pain. That's the story of my life and my family. So I, I was, and I'm going to do this Right now, a little meditation. I don't usually do guided meditation, but for one minute, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna ask you to reflect on this. Buddha left his wife and his child. He left them. And the story goes, it was in the middle of the night. What does that mean? He left in the middle of the night. He didn't talk to his wife and say, I'm going to leave you. He couldn't face her, he couldn't face his child. He just left in the middle of the night. What does that mean? What does that bring up for us? Let's reflect on that. Let's sit with that for like a minute.
One thing it brings up for me is, you coward. What a coward you are. Leave in the middle of the night. But the story continues that, you know, he's, he left because he needed to find something. Who knows what that was. <clears throat> but the story does turn around and say that many years later, his son and his wife became his disciples because of whatever he was thinking, he found and shared with others. Well, maybe <clears throat> I know that Sutta, he's category all she's talking about. Maybe not, but I'll, I'll share it with you. <clears throat> it's one of my, I have favorable, uh, several favorite um, suttas from the Pali Canon, and this is one of them. It's called Jungle Thickets. So, oh, eight minutes. Yeah, I better get moving. <laughs> Um, so in this sutta, um, you know, the Buddha is talking to his uh, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, and he said, it's basically about when a practitioner should leave the forest when they should get out, if they're practicing in the forest. Because he, just like Kadigiri Roshi uh, said, he would often advocate for his disciples to go to a quiet place in the forest and sit alo alone. But he also wrote this sutta that says, well, there's a time when you need to leave the forest, maybe. And uh, I actually read this for the first time when I was living here at Hokyoji in solitude. I lived here for almost two years by myself. That's when there wasn't any electricity or running water. And, uh, and so it made a pretty uh, big impression on me. But this is a very interesting teaching. I'll, I'll summarize it for you. Is, um, um, succinctly as I can. Basically, I'll read this uh, paragraph. <clears throat> he said, here, bhikkhus, or bhikkhunis, bhikkhus is men, bhikkhunis is uh, women. A monk or nun lives in some jungle thicket. While he or she is living there, Unestablished mindfulness does not become established. Unconcentrated mind does not become concentrated. The person does not attain a supreme security from bondage and also the requisites, requisites of life that should be obtained by, go, by one gone forth, robes, alm food, resting place, and medicinal re requisites are hummed are hard to come by. That person, practitioner, should consider this. I'm living here and I'm not really getting anything out of it and I'm not, I'm not getting well fed. And, um, and then the, the, the uh, Buddha recommends that person should depart from that jungle thicket that very night or that very day and should not continue living there. So there's three other scenarios. One, uh, that still the, there's no concentrated mind arising, but he's getting, he or she's getting well fed. Yeah, I'm finding 
I'm getting a, but still nothing's really happening in terms of my spiritual development. And the Bhikkhu, um, Buddha recommends, having reflected thus, that Bhikkhu should depart from that jungle thicket. Should not continue living there. But he doesn't say that very day or that very night. He just says, think it over. Maybe it's time to leave. The third re, um, scenario is he does, or he or she does uh, attain deeper spiritual awakening, but uh, the requisites of life are hard to come by, and the Buddha says, you should continue living there, even if the requisites of life are hard to come by, but you're developing spiritually. And then the last one is when you're developing spiritually, and the requisites of life are coming Easily, he says, you should just stay there and not depart. But the most interesting thing about this sutta is he goes through one, two, three, four, five other scenarios in which it's not in a jungle thicket. One is in here, bhikkhus, or uh, Bhikkhu or Bhikkhuni, Bhikkhuni lives in dependence upon a certain village, a certain village. And then the four things, just exactly the same. And then the next scenario is a Bhikkhu lives on a certain town, dependent on a certain town, and then a certain city, and then a certain country. In the same four scenarios. And the last one is a bhikkhu lives in dependence upon a certain person. Now, this is, I think, what's really interesting for me in this sutta is that that first scenario where you're not developing spiritually and you're not getting well fed and you're living in dependence on a certain person, the Buddha says, you should, you should depart from that person without taking leave. You should not continue to follow him or her. You should leave that very day or that very night. And I think what that means in our modern day uh, interpretation is you're in an abusive relationship. So you don't need to say goodbye to that person. You just leave immediately. And then he goes through the other scenarios of which you're not developing spiritually with that person, but you're getting well fed. And then he suggests you should leave, but say goodbye. Express your appreciation for the person, but it's time to leave. You shouldn't just leave without giving your respects. And then the last scenario is that, and this, this is probably the most interesting line or paragraph to me in the whole sutta, is that you're living in dependence upon a certain person and you're getting, you're developing spiritually and you're getting well fed. And he says, that practitioner should continue following that person as long as life lasts. The person should not depart from that person. And here's the most interesting part, even if you're told to go away. <laughs> to, I mean, isn't that interesting? <laughs> I mean, this is the Pali canon. And uh, I, I just love it because it's so human. You know, even if this teacher says, go away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, no, don't, you know, if it's going okay, just stay there, irritate the person. <laughs> Your teacher tell his wits, his or her wits ends, but don't leave. 
So I really love that suit though. Let's see. <clears throat> uh, my time's up. I've said enough. I could go on, but um, please take what you need. So, does anyone? Pardon me. Somebody please say take something. what you need. I didn't understand. Take what you need for time. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, well, really, I think I've had enough. Um, let's see if there's anything. I could go back to Kadigiri Roshi's uh, chapter here. So he says, strictly speaking, no matter what situation you are in, happy or sad, you live alone. And your practice is to walk steadily and alone. Most people read this teaching in a pessimistic way, but it is not pessimistic or negative way of life at all. If we understand it properly, it is actually very positive. The Buddha taught that if you come across a true friend, one who is noble, fearless, thoughtful, and wise, then walk with that friend in peace. If you find such a friend, you can walk together for life. But don't be too eager to find such a friend. If you become greedy for such a friend, you will be disappointed and you will not be able to live in peace and harmony with others. So that's not only true for students, but it's true for teachers. Don't be so eager to find such a friend <laughs> to walk with forever. If you are eager to find such a person, you will become disappointed. Uh, oh yeah, let me go. I'll read one more paragraph because it alludes to something I said I was going to talk about earlier. In ancient times in India, people would look to find such a good friend. If they found such a person, they would sit with him or her. This is how it was with Buddha. As people began to gather around him, he called them shravakas, which means listeners. The relationship between the Buddha and those who came to listen to his teaching was not like that of a boss and an employee, or a parent and a child. It was more like that of a master and an apprentice. If you go to see and listen to such a wise friend, you are not a student, exactly. You are just a listener. The idea of being called a student came about in a later age. I've never been comfortable calling people my students. <laughs> it just doesn't sound right. So that helps me understand why I'm not comfortable with that term. It's something, it came about later when you have teacher and student. And it just doesn't, it doesn't resonate with me at all. So maybe, yeah, listeners, maybe some people like, certain people will listen to you. <laughs> A little bit, not completely, <laughs> but a lot of the time, most of the time. There's another sutta where it's very moving, where the, the Buddha talks about, there are some disciples who will do what you say. Uh, well, they say they don't, actually they don't listen, they don't do what you want them to do and what how do you react is it it's who who's the person who's fit to be instructor of a group is the name of a little title he says well you have to be a person who if you have disciples 
and they don't do what you say and they don't listen to you, you, you have to like not be disappointed. <laughs> and, uh, and they go through the like, four different scenarios again, you know, those who, I don't know, they do what you want them to do, but they don't listen to you, <laughs> something like that. And you're still okay with it. <laughs> and finally, those, those, those who actually do what you'd like to see, have them do and they listen to you and still you're okay. It's not like you get really excited about it. So that, that's kind of going to be uh, fit. I'm, I'm really finished. Okay. So that's all I have to say. If there's any comments or questions, uh, please uh, chime in. So. And I think uh, now you just have to like raise your hand or turn off your mic or something, if you have something to say. And I just say, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I see uh, my glasses on. It looks like Kikan, did you? And Myo had, had their hand up or something. Who wants to go first? Looks like it's me, maybe. Hi, Dokai san yeah. and everybody. Um, <clears throat> oh, I gave the talk last week, and uh, what I was talking about was what Katagiri said, well, part of what Katagiri <laughs> said about uh, Fukan Zazengi. And there were uh, six things in this kind of system he had, but and I believe, if I remember correctly, the first one was arranging circumstances. Uh, which, I, if I remember correctly, uh, related to, amongst other things in Fukan Zazengi, uh, casting aside all affairs, uh, or, or all, how does it go? Casting aside all, uh, I can't remember exactly, but you probably know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm wondering if, if that is, uh, if you see that as pretty much the same as this uh, sutta, uh of the of the jungle thicket or if there's a, a difference there well i think uh you know um people come to hokyoji they make great effort to get here uh they usually have to except all, those of us who live here but you have to travel a ways usually and um particularly if you come for like a week-long retreat or whatever you know, it's a, a huge effort. You have to take time off your work or arrange for circumstances. And then when you arrive, you still, you have an idea about what you want to do. And it's like, well, I'm going to like do a retreat. I'm going to like sit Zazen. And uh, still, when you get here, you don't do it. <laughs> it's like, you, you know, even though you've made all this effort to get here, it's like uh, we we still just carry on our affairs. So it doesn't matter really too much about our life circumstances, you know, that the way I see it, you know, if we have family or whatever. But when we sit down and do a period of zazen, what, what prevents us from actually just doing that period of zazen? Just... For, for the 35 minutes or so that we're sitting, just let everything go. I mean, do you have to think about, you know, your parents, your sister, your brother, your sisters, or whatever? <laughs> but it's, uh, it's not so easy to do, to just let cast aside those affairs. But that's really the spirit of Zazen. And that's where we need to go to really find some kind of peace or happiness. It's just right here, right here in this moment. There's nothing else. You know, we're constantly looking for something else to uh, occur or to happen, to make somehow resolve all of our internal conflict. 
But the only way that's going to happen is if we actually just settle ourselves right into this moment, just as it is, whatever our circumstances are. So that's to cast aside all affairs and involvement, it, just for 35 minutes. I mean, the world's not going to stop you know, if, if you actually throw yourself into this zazen, you know, whatever problems there are out there, you know, they're, they're not going to end. I mean, they're not going to like, the world's not going to collapse just because you stop thinking about it for 35 minutes. So that's uh, the practice we have to continue to do. And sometimes, you know, that, that takes a week. We maybe have to take a few days of really trying to settle in to realize what that is about. It just does, doesn't happen in a few minutes. Last week I gave a Dharma talk and uh, did I tell you that already? That I was really sick. And, and uh, so that made it kind of easier because I was really sick. <laughs> I'm not so sick right now, so that makes the talk a little harder to give. <laughs> but uh, I, I talked about three kinds of uh, awakening experiences. One is the awakening, the awakening experience of which you've had a tragic, tragic pain in your life. You've lost your mother or your father or your child or um, your lover, something. And it just wrecks your body with pain. Now, you don't think of that as an enlightenment experience, but it is what changes us. It's what changes our direction, where we're going. And the other kind <clears throat> is uh, like the, the kind of, and you don't, you would never call that an awakening experience. You, know, you would just want to call it. And then another kind is when you actually know that, oh, I've uh, had awakening experience. That's like when I'm here at Hokyoji, and I'm doing a session and doing lots of zazen, and it's kind of a summer day, and we do kinhin on the deck, and I you kind of round a corner sometimes, and then this breeze kind of hits you, and you just it's like, oh my god, <laughs> it's like the world stops, and you just feel like this is it. You know, I, I, I see, I see it. And my uh, opinion of that kind of experience is like, pfft, thumbs down. It's like, all that happens is that you just want it again because it's there for like 35 seconds and, and then it goes. And then all you do is crave, crave it again. The third kind is, is more subtle. And it doesn't seem like an awakening at all, but it's these little moments that just change your life. Um, I'll just give you one example. I had a, a, a cousin who was uh, very cognitively challenged, extremely. So he couldn't speak. Um, couldn't talk language. But every time he would see you, he would just put his arms, he was really strong, he was about my size, but he was really, really muscular. And he would just come up to you and wrap your, his arms around you and squeeze you like a hug every time. And he saw you and then, you know, it'd be three minutes later and you'd do it again. Oh, <laughs> and, he kind of really touched my heart. 
and he died when was, he was 16 years old. And I was in high school. I think he was a year younger than me. But it was in this little town, Moville, Iowa. And it was like a February or a March, something like that. And I mean, it was bleak. It was just nothing but shades of gray. I stepped outside. It wasn't really a freezing cold day. It was like, oh, 28 degrees. So you could actually stay out there for a few minutes without shivering. But I just stepped outside and I looked down this little town street, nothing extraordinary at all to look at, but I just, my world stopped. That was when I was 17 years old. I didn't have any kind of uh, opinion about it at the time. Not till years later, and even now that I said, something happened to me at that moment. Something opened up that I never saw. But I didn't think of it as any kind of enlightenment experience at the time. Is that okay, Kika, for an answer? Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mio On, did, did you have a question? Actually, I didn't. But I, I, I can say something. That when you were speaking of Shakyamuni's departure from his home before he was a Buddha, that you were speaking of him going in the middle of the night and not saying goodbye and this and that. And I've read some other things, like this book I was telling you about, The Old Path, White Clouds, and mm -hmm. there's a little bit different version of it. Mm -hmm. And so, and more of his wife being very involved in his process and very mm. supportive. She, mm. she was his cousin. And so I'm not going to go into it too much, but there are some other versions <clears throat> and it was very eye-opening to me when I was reading that book and I've read some other things because we've always thought that he just abandoned them without mm. their buy-in. And mm. it seems like there's other opinions about that. And mm. I think, you know, for my own self, when I was becoming ordained, that Tim Burkett was very clear with us that you need to get the blessings of your family, that that was a very foundational thing if we wanted to become ordained. And mm. I think it, it was very important, you know, not just my husband, but also my children, and, and to have their support really made doing this possible. And so mm. I just wanted to say that, you know, that there is... I actually think that's more the way it was, too. He actually set it up that she was going to be cared for and the son. I've read versions of that, too. But there is the tale that yes. he left in the middle of the night. <laughs> yes. And, so. and I think... I think that's true, that he left in the middle of the night, but I'm not going to go into too much, but I think Yasodara, his wife, was very cognizant of it. I think he had to deal with his father, who did not want him to leave, you know? Yeah, maybe so. So, but maybe I'm not... The dad. But, yes, so... Could have been the dad thing. Yeah, yes, so... Okay. Well, any other comments or questions? We are kind of getting close to the end of our time here.
All right. Well, thank you so much for your kind attention and listening to my talk. Uh, so we're going to just close with a chant. Is that what we do? Well, I have some announcements. I think oh, announcements I first. Announcements okay. before the chant. Um, so next Sunday, June 8th, Shokin Weinkoff from Rumanji will be speaking. And he, the title of his talk, which could change, but right now is Let's Keep Walking. Uh, you can see the full lineup of speakers for the coming week <coughs> on our website, uh, hokyoji.org. Video of today's talk and past Sunday talks are also available on the website. Another way you can support Hokyoji is by connecting with our Facebook page. The, the, the Sunday talks and other announcements and information about the community are available there. Um, please like our Facebook page and consider sharing our content with your friends who may be interested in learning about Hokyoji and may even want to visit. And Hokyoji is open for anyone to come visit you know, we, we do have scheduled retreats and things, but lately there's been many people who have come and done solo retreats, or there's been people who have come with their families to get away from the city. And so please think of Hokyoji if you want to get away from your usual life. Okay. So, um, finally, as always, our generosity sustains Hokyoji's faculties and programs. We could not do this without you. Please consider making a donation online. There's a donation link posted in the chat. Um, your gift of any amount will be of great benefit. And we are deeply grateful for your support. Thank you again, Dokai-san. And to close, we'll, we'll chant the four vows together. But everyone but myself will be on mute, I think. The text is posted in the chat if you need it. And then we'll have a... Oh, and that's it. Okay. So here we go. Beings are numberless, I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible, I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless, I vow to enter them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable. I vow to realize it. Thank you everyone for coming. And, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon next week. And if you'd like to unmute, you can say goodbye to everyone. Oh. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Good day. Bye-bye. See you there. Goodbye.